Welcome back to the In Chamber. I'm your host, Tom Schumann. Innovation is today's topic. Look at your favorite dictionary or thesaurus, and here are some terms aligned with innovation. They include brainchild, concoction, contrivance, creation, invention. Uh, the last two, in my opinion, are okay. I'm not sure about some of the others, but uh, we'll stick with innovation. Last month, the Indiana Chamber released its most recent study related to the Indiana Vision 2025 plan. And as a reminder, the mission of that plan is Indiana will be a global leader in innovation and economic opportunity where enterprises and citizens prosper. A couple of key metrics in that plan. Indiana's 44th in the rate of new entrepreneurs, according to the Kauffman Foundation, and 47th in the share of total employment at firms less than five years old. We're going to talk innovation today and the importance of it within the, the corporate world. Our guest is the leader of High Alpha Innovation, a company founded to help other organizations create and grow startup firms. Elliot Parker, welcome to the In Chamber. Thanks. Nice, Tom. Nice to, uh, nice to be here. All right, Elliot. I threw out some words, some synonyms related to innovation. How does Elliot Parker describe innovation? That's a good question. It's a innovation is a word we hear so often. It's almost uh, it's almost devoid of meaning at this point. Uh, it's a word we toss around um, uh, and use without a, a good understanding or a shared understanding of what we mean when we say it. Often we we see that in boardrooms. I I define innovation very simply, and this is a definition that came from a former colleague of mine. It's simply something new that creates impact. That's it. It's different from an invention. An invention may, may uh, not have impact. Innovation is when you take that invention, put it into market, and create, hopefully, a positive impact in the world. Uh, that's innovation. It's, and it's very hard to do. Well, I, I like the simple definition, but as you said, definitely hard to do. So innovation is one thing, but, but High Alpha Innovation has a goal to launch 100 startups in five years. That's a lot of innovation, Elliot. How, how, you, how are you and the team going to do that? Yeah, it's a very aspirational goal. We are, we, we, we're driven, kind of motivated by this idea of creating as much opportunity for as many people as we can. And we think that startups are a good way to do that. And so, yeah, we've, we've set this lofty goal to launch 100 startups over the next five years. And we, we've got a plan for doing it. Um, it is a lofty goal, but it, it's also realistic. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to take this venture studio model that High Alpha has developed over the last five years and make it accessible to more people and specifically to uh, large scaled enterprises who we think can benefit from this approach to innovation. So the way that we get to 100 startups is by making this model available to partners that we can work with, who we can, we can bring into our ecosystem and team up and work together to get this done. We. Uh, we are kind of firm believers that, uh, first of all, society benefits when large scaled enterprises are successful at innovating. Um, there's uh, creative destruction is, I believe, a good thing. It, however, it's, it's very, very inefficient. And we think it can be much more efficient and, and less harmful to people that it sometimes impacts. And so if, if scaled enterprises can be better at innovating, everybody wins. Uh, we think that this venture studio model has, we've shown over the last five years uh, has produced a lot of innovation. And we've shown that you can take startups and create those startups in a systematic way. For large organizations, the startup can be a fantastic learning engine. And so that we believe, we believe that teaming up in this way, we, we're, we're very good at, at designing business models, launching businesses, uh, getting those scaled quickly. Uh, the corporate partners that we team up with have deep understanding of their markets and customers and uh, knowledge of, of the spaces in which they play. And when we can team those, when we, we can marry those things up, everybody wins. We can create new innovative companies that, uh, that drive learning in these big organizations and that provide opportunity to people involved. So, so Elliot, most people know, as you said, about the, the high alpha model over the last five years and how you created startups, but now we're talking about doing it within large scale enterprises. Uh, I watched a, a speech you gave last year at a conference and you talked about three things that corporations do well, big enterprises, and then three separate things that startups excel at. 
but if you would describe those a little bit, but maybe even more importantly, talk about how it's not necessarily companies going from one set of three to the other, but trying to blend those two together. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good question. You go back to kind of the reason why these large companies exist to begin with. Uh, corporations exist to uh, to pull in resources, assets, people into the kind of the walls of the corporation and to manage transactions between them in a way that achieves lower cost than they would get if they were operating out in the open market. That lower cost is uh, translated into profit for these corporations. So corporations are designed by design, by definition, are built to execute and to execute at scale to do so um, efficiently. It may not always feel like that when you're working inside a large corporation, but they are very, very efficient, very good at getting things done. Uh, you think about the, um, you know, the laptop that I'm using to, to talk to you on that is built by a large corporation that is very good at coordinating, at executing and doing so very efficiently. Um, so corporations are built with a set of incentives and governance and talent and processes designed to execute at scale and to do so uh, to coordinate. Is it fair to call that, is it fair to almost call that transactional? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah in, in a way, that's one way to think about it, right? Um, the, um, it, the, the challenge is that um, uh, competition is, is more fierce than it's ever been. Uh, and for organizations to win, they have to be very good at learning and learning quickly large scale enterprises are not designed to learn. They're designed to affect these transactions inside the corporation to coordinate. Um, uh, in business, startups are vehicles that are designed to learn. Startups are very good at learning, pivoting quickly, at, uh, at disrupting and at moving fast. And startups, if you think about it, they've got the incentives and the governance and the process and the talent in place uh, that is designed to, to foster and encourage that learning. And so the, the, the challenge a lot of companies face, a lot of CEOs see what's happening out in the market, see these startups popping up and creating tremendous amounts of value. If you look at the most valuable companies in the world right now, a lot of them didn't exist even 20 years ago, right? So we look at this and say, well, startups are able to create so much value um, CEOs of, of skilled enterprises often, I believe, make the mistake of saying we need to act more like a startup. The reason why I think that's a mistake is that skilled enterprises are not startups. Most startups fail. You don't want your skilled enterprise to fail. Uh, skilled enterprises are good at certain things and they should leverage, they should, they should get better and better at those things, not try to abandon those things, the, the ability to coordinate and to execute. Don't abandon those for this kind of false hope that you're going to act more like a startup. That's a mistake. The, the trick we believe is that skilled enterprises need to get better at what they do well while figuring out how to leverage the learning ability of startups. And that's why we believe this, this method of innovating through external startups can be so effective for skilled enterprises. Another question, Elliot, related to this relationship between large scale and startups. But before you came to High Alpha, you spent six years in Boston working with, uh, with Clayton Christensen, the, the professor and author of the firm InnoSight. And in that same speech I referenced earlier, you mentioned how Clayton Christensen has a kind of a mantra of companies innovating far from their core business model. Now, to the uninformed, to, like me, I'm thinking they should be innovating close to their core business model. But, but what, is, what does it mean to innovate far from? How can you describe that? Yeah, this, is, this goes back to Clay's original theory of disruptive innovation, the idea that uh, this idea of the innovator's dilemma, that inside of large organizations, inside of companies, we are incentivized to um, uh, to get better and better at providing services and products to our our most profitable and valuable customers. And as a result, what happens is that we, um, we improve the um, uh, kind of the functionality of our products or services in line with those, those customers over time so that we can move up market and earn more profit and operate in a capital efficient way. And as we move up market, what happens is our, our, our products or services um, are overshooting the needs of many consumers in the marketplace. And so you end up getting a lot of non-consumption or, or consumers who just aren't quite satisfied with what you're providing. 
Uh, we see this all the time. Uh, uh, you know, an easy example is uh, the remote control with your TV is a form of this, right? It's got a million buttons on there. You don't need all those buttons. You need the power of the channel, the volume. But it gets over-designed, uh, you know, targeted towards the, the, the most adept customers. What this does inside of companies is it leaves them ripe to disruption at the low end where new competitors can come online with, with a good enough product, uh, something that's very simple. It targets the needs of those consumers whose, whose needs may not be as sophisticated. What happens is those new products that come into the market over time go at that same curve and eventually displace the companies that were there to begin with. That's, that's the, uh, the innovator's dilemma is that we can do everything right, make all the right decisions, and still our companies will fail. And this is a very, very hard challenge to solve. Uh, very, one of the most difficult. Uh, that, you know, ultimately, if you think about the challenge every company faces, is you have to simultaneously improve your core business while inventing what's going to come next. And as I mentioned a minute ago, the, these two activities require a very different set of governance process, incentives, and talent. And so the question is, how, to, how do you execute and do that? Uh, it's it's a it's a real challenge. It's very hard to do. Well, let's talk about a couple of companies that, that High Alpha Innovation is already working with and that are prime examples of, of successfully doing this. Uh, you know, again, most of those listening are aware of Cummins and then the work it's done over the years in, in diesel engines, but also certainly recently how innovative it has been as far as looking outside of those opportunities. As you've become familiar, more familiar with Cummins, what makes it innovative and successful at what it does? Yeah, Cummins is amazing. You know, you've got this hundred-year-old manufacturer of diesel engines, right? Very physical things. But a, a company where the leadership recognizes, uh, you know, as Mark Andreessen, venture capitalist, said 10 years ago, 12 years ago now, software is eating the world. Uh, it's true. Uh, you know, this digital transformation is happening in every industry. Every company, to some extent, needs to become a software company, uh, at least adept at using and deploying software. And I think that one of the things that Cummins is doing very well is recognizing this. And it's, it's a really interesting question. What does digital transformation look like in a hundred year old manufacturer of diesel engines? And they're tackling it head on. And I, uh, you know, admire them a lot for that. We, we teamed up a couple of years ago, High Alpha and Cummins and launched a startup called Anvil uh, that we're very proud about. Uh, that's doing some great work to reduce uh, workplace injuries for field technicians. So it's, um, uh, you know, a very, uh, very, uh, I, I admire very much the, uh, the leadership team at Cummins that is, is uh, taking this head on and, and trying to figure out what digital transformation looks like in a, a company that is known for and so good at making physical, physical tangible products. Elliot, another company uh, that uh, I'm more familiar with even is Allegiant. Uh, we had Rob Martins of Allegiant on a few months ago in, in one of these conversations, and he's also contributed to some of our BizVoice conversations. Uh, Allegiant has a venture fund. They have the new pin and tumbler studio. Uh, talk about what you see with Allegiant and, and, again, how, again, we're looking at a, a legacy company, a leader in their industry but also looking at being on that leading or cutting edge of innovation. Yeah, yeah, what a great example I, of, of experimentation. And that, that really is what this comes down to in the end. If you think about, um, especially right now in this moment, you've got a lot of big companies that are, are, are looking at the current environment uh, that we're in and trying to extrapolate or figure out what's going to happen next, trying to predict the future. Uh, this is uh, this is very hard, if not impossible, to do, especially right now. We're in a, a, an environment at the moment nobody's ever been through before. We don't know what's going to happen next, and uh, you know, trying to to do scenario planning right now is is harder than it might normally be. Scenario planning is useful as a way to kind of push our thinking about what might happen. It is not a good idea to rely on those scenarios to, to make significant bets in terms of, uh, you know, predicting narrow futures that we might act around. The, the key to success in environments, especially like this, is experimentation. We say, to go make as many mistakes as you can at the cheapest possible cost per mistake. It's how you build optionality. It's how you build resilience in an organization. And one of the things I love about what uh, what the team of the Legion is doing right now 
is just the, the level of experimentation. Um, let's let's try it. Let's try things right now. See what happens. Let's build some optionality so that we're prepared for a range of possible futures, uh, because the future is very hard to predict. Well, you were you're up. You you and anyone in the innovation space, you're already operating in an era in an era of uncertainty, which has just been, as you said, expanded upon with with what we're going through currently. Has that been one of the big changes, though? What you just described in large scale enterprises that they are they've adapted the mindset that they're not afraid to make those mistakes and and to do that experimenting in a, in a startup setting. Well, I mean, this this comes back to the core challenge of running a, a scaled enterprise, right? Uh, especially in a crisis, um, what you have to do to be able to say we're gonna we're we are going to experiment and we're going to build some optionality for the future. What that requires is you to say we're not going to be as capital efficient right now as we otherwise would be, right? We're going to take some capital that would be going to the bottom line otherwise, and we're going to redeploy it to run some experiments that may or may not pay off. That goes against everything that we're taught in business school, everything that we're taught in running businesses. Uh, the goal is always capital efficiency. Well, it turns out that's not always a good objective for innovation. You can, of course, innovate to, uh, to be more capital efficient. And to some extent, that's helpful. But companies can also go overboard. If your company is optimized too much around capital efficiency, it's like we, we use the analogy of a, of a forest fire. You think about the... Um, uh, a couple of years ago, there's that uh, that big forest fire out in Paradise, California. One of the reasons for that fire was that for many, many years leading up to that fire, uh, our fire suppression policy in California had been to, to to not let any fires go, to reduce volatility. And as a result, when the big fire came, it was very big and very dangerous. A similar thing happens in companies. We operate companies to be very capital efficient, to optimize for capital efficiency to reduce volatility. And as a result, when a crisis comes, a crisis hits particularly hard because the companies, as a result of that focus on capital efficiency, have become fragile over time. Sometimes unrecognizable, like you don't see it until the crisis comes. And it comes, you realize how fragile the organization is. And so innovation, uh, a, a better goal for innovation than capital efficiency is resilience. And by running lots of experiments and cheap experiments, uh, we believe through the form of startups can be a good way to do that. Uh, companies can build more optionality and resilience in, in ways they're, they're, they're mimicking the, uh, the way that nature innovates, right? Rather than centralizing innovation and centralizing failure when it happens, nature innovates at the margins, runs lots of little small experiments that uh, are able to organically uh, succeed or fail and as a result, the, the ecosystem, nature, learns from those and adapts. Scaled enterprises are complex systems, just like ecosystems, just, just like nature, and ought to be innovating in similar ways. Run lots of cheap experiments. See what happens and do those at the margin. Don't centralize failure. That's not a good idea. Mm -hmm. So, so Elliot, uh, High Alpha, obviously, the name, the brand has, has certainly been so successful and established uh, in, in recent years. You... You've worked with some of the large scale enterprises, but you, you kind of started working directly with them earlier this year. And then High Alpha Innovation, the entity itself, just announced, uh, you know, within the past month or so. I imagine you have uh, your, your phone and your, your email and text and everything are pretty busy with companies reaching out to you. How do you determine what are the best organizations to work with? And, and can you kind of quickly tell if that large scale enterprise is ready for this next stage? Yeah, we do. Uh, we, we can tell pretty quickly. Some of the things that we're looking for, we're, we're looking for, number one, uh, leadership that's very engaged in innovation, recognizes the importance of it. Number two, they need to have a clear strategic rationale for pursuing innovation through startup creation. And that's something sometimes we, we work with the companies we work with to help them understand why this fits into the other things that we do. What we do is not a silver bullet for innovation. It should be part of a broad portfolio of activities that companies are using, deploying to pursue innovation. And so at companies we work with, we just want them to understand how this fits into their other activities. Um, we also, one of the things we look for is we look for overlapping interests, right? So uh, the companies that we, we work with, uh, they may have some strategic themes or some areas that they're focusing on to find innovative opportunities. 
we will uh, do some initial work together to just identify um, are those interests, are those themes interesting to us as well? Do we believe there's opportunity within those themes to go build companies? The answer most of the time is yes. I mean, we believe our process can be, uh, if you deploy the process that we use, we can go find opportunities to build businesses just about anywhere. But we wanna make sure that we, we see an opportunity in those themes to build very valuable uh, software enabled companies because you can get so much scale so quickly that way. So those are a few of the things that we're, we're looking for. Well, and we talked about the the goal earlier of a, of a hundred companies in five years. I don't think I mentioned that you're currently doing this with with a high alpha innovation team of seven employees, which even seems to add to the challenge a little bit more. You mentioned it earlier, but talk about the importance of the partnerships and, and how again it's your team of seven partnering with the large scale enterprise, partnering with I'm sure outside investors and others, but. Talk about how that team effort really is, is crucial to all of this. Yeah, we are a small but mighty team. We started High Alpha Innovation and spun it out of High Alpha earlier this year with three employees. We're actually, uh, we're growing pretty fast and uh, uh, up to uh, uh, soon have 12 employees on the team. So team is growing because we have a lot of work to do and lots of opportunity out there. But yeah, it, it is, it's a very important partnership. We, we don't, um, when we work with these large companies to create startups, we do view it as a partnership. Uh, we, we've got skin in the game too. Um, we are, are uh, we're both investing together to, to, to make this happen. And um, we've got skills uh, and assets, as I mentioned, we're very good at business model design at uh, getting these companies, identifying opportunities, vetting those opportunities getting new companies launched and then uh, supported and scaled. That's what a venture studio does so well, does it systematically. And our, our, our companies that we work with, they've got amazing insights into uh, problems that exist in their markets that need to be solved. And so that partnership is so, so important. When we work with companies, often that first piece of, of ideation where we're coming up with new business ideas Often within a few weeks of working together, we can generate you know, 300, 500 new business ideas through our process, but it's a combination of both extraction and generation. Typically, the companies we work with have a number of latent ideas lying around um, that we, we, can, we can build on and, and add to. Uh, there's also an opportunity for generation of new ideas. We find that the combined uh, viewpoints, us as venture builders and investors, big corporate uh, partners that we work with is you know with their deep expertise in the markets when we team up to do that idea generation collectively we can come up with things that neither of us would have thought of on our own and it's that that coming together that is uh, is so valuable to generate uh, ideas that um, that we think can can turn into a uh, big valuable uh, startups Elliot, uh, High Alpha Innovation, certainly working with companies in Indiana and, and beyond. And you look for opportunities throughout the country, but how, how much of a game changer or difference maker can you see this making for Indiana? And kind of goes back to some of those rankings I mentioned earlier in, in our 2025 report. Some momentum in Indiana, some good things going on, but as a state as a whole, obviously we, we still need more innovation, we need more companies, we need more people to, in those companies. How, how big of a difference do you think this could make in, in Indiana? Boy, those rankings are shocking. We need to fix that, don't we? Um, we do, absolutely. We, uh, That's what we've been talking about. <laughs> I, I, I hope we can have a big amp impact on this. Um, you think one of the things I, I think is really interesting about High Alpha right now, and one of the, one of the reasons I'm, I'm so excited about what we're doing collectively, High Alpha and High Alpha Innovation. You look across the portfolio of companies that we've created over the last five years at High Alpha, and uh, those companies are employing more than 500 people now. Those are 500 people who are 500 plus people who are now learning what it's like to build a venture backed startup that they're that that you can scale. Uh, they're learning how to do it. And when their company is successful and achieves its goals, they're going to be ready to go do it on their own and start the next one. And so it's a, it's a, it becomes a self-propagating thing. It's not quick and it's not immediate. It takes years, maybe even decades. But um, I think the seeds are planted and uh, there are a lot of good things, a lot of good things happening. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not from here. I've moved to Indiana twice, both coasts. Um, and uh, for, for good reasons, but the, um, 
to me, Indiana feels like a, a place on the rise right now. There are a lot of good things happening. Uh, when I, I, you know, um, before when we were traveling, <laughs> spent a lot of time out in the Bay Area and a lot of curiosity about what's going on and the things that are happening, especially in the tech scene in Indiana. Uh, people are, are hearing good things about it. And that's, uh, it's great. I, I think there are a lot of good things to come. Well, you mentioned some of those high alpha companies. Well, we're talking to the day after the Miro Award, certainly we saw some of those high alpha companies honored just last night. And you know, a number of them in the last couple of years have also been on a program we run called Best Places to Work in Indiana. So they've, they've applied, they, they've been winners, and, and we've got that event coming up soon. But yeah, the, the growing some great seeds. You mentioned coming to Indiana twice. Uh, so you, you worked with Roche and you, and you co-founded a, in a, in a Novo Partners in Carmel, as you said, went, went to Boston. What brought you back the second time a few years ago, specifically to, to be with High Alpha and, and kind of some of the things you're doing now? Yeah, it, well, it's, it's, it's a very good question. Um, so we, uh, my wife and I are both from Southern California. We thought we would uh, spend our whole lives there and uh, ended up in Indiana through an internship uh, with a, a colleague of mine at High Alpha now, Mike Fitzgerald, who was running corporate ventures at Roche at the time. And uh, Mike is very persuasive on the phone. And uh, after a half hour phone call, I still remember, I still remember where I was standing at, at, uh, at business school in California uh, on the phone, a uh, half hour conversation. Uh, he invited me to come out to Indiana and work with them. And uh, I'm always up for adventure and decided we would do it. I, the funny thing is I'll remember my, my wife and I driving out with our kids um, uh, that summer to Indiana getting ready to come do this internship. I remember the conversation in the car on the way saying, what if we, uh, what if we like it? <laughs> this was something we hadn't, hadn't prepared for because just the expectation was that we were always going to be in California. We as opposed right to what, as opposed to what is the fear if you don't <laughs> like it, you're, you're looking at it. What if we do like it and want to stay? Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, you know, we don't have any family in Indiana. This was, this was a, a, a new thing and just a, a, a you know, a thought that we hadn't entertained before we came out, it turned out we did like it. We found it's a wonderful place to raise kids um, and have a good, uh, a good quality of living. Indiana is an easy place to live and, and we love it here. And so we did, we moved to Boston for several years. I, it, this was a, um, you know, I'd been a, a long time admirer of Clay Christensen and thought if I ever had a chance to work with him, I would drop everything and go do that and be in his orbit. And we, we did, the opportunity came up and we did it. And then, um, you know, a couple of years ago, um, the, uh, the consulting firm, uh, in a site was acquired and, you know, trying to figure out what, what comes next. And, uh, had this idea uh, about uh, how to help big companies innovate through startup engagement, collaboration, and was was starting to go around and, and share that idea with some people and um, thinking about how to, to, to put that into action and ran into my old friends, uh, Christian Anderson and Mike Fitzgerald at High Alpha, who had just closed on their second fund and um, thought, you know, we ought to, we ought to join forces and team up. And so within a, Within a month, I was uh, working with my friends at High Alpha, and we were uh, we were packing up things in Boston and moving back to Indiana. So, um, I, I'd say the uh, the thing that brought me back is uh, is good friends um, and uh, and a lot of opportunity. Excellent. So, Elliot, you've talked about family and traveling a little bit. What are some things that you like to do in your spare time when when you're when you're not working on innovation prod projects? Yeah, travel travel is a big one. I was talking to you today from a road trip. We're in, in Utah making our way to California. Uh, travel is a big one with our my wife and I. We've got five kids, and we uh, think that uh, taking the, showing them the world is a good way to help them understand um, and, 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 and be educated about uh, how, things, how things work. Um, uh, I, uh, one of my hobbies is, uh, is making ice cream. Uh, if you're anybody... <laughs> likes good ice cream. We've always got some at our house in the freezer. It's a uh, a good habit. On the flip side of that, it means I also have to uh, to swim uh, a lot and work out to make up for the uh, the other side of of that. The um, uh, one of the things that I, I love to do is uh, is surf. I grew up surfing in California, and I, I I don't know how many people in Indiana have a a garage full of surfboards, but um, I do, <laughs> probably not many others do. We've got them there because I take pretty frequent 
we try to take pretty frequent surf trips uh, to, uh, to, to scratch that itch. Well, let, let's go back to that ice cream for a minute. So you're in Utah now. We've not met. We've actually not talked before today. So when you get back in Indianapolis and, and we got some uh, restrictions or easing of current restrictions, we might have to connect over that ice cream a little bit. Love it. Yep. Let's do it. All right, Elliot, final question I've got for you. And we ask everybody this during the current season. Uh, and, and the question is, what does success mean to you? So you think about it from a personal standpoint or a professional standpoint, and I think you'll probably have a little bit of a unique perspective on this just based on the type of work that you do. But, but when, you, when you, you mull that a little bit, what, do, what do you, would you describe as, as being you know, either a successful day or a successful venture for you? Uh, what a good question. Yeah, success to me is is fulfillment and it's finding joy. I think that's uh, why we're on the surf is to find joy. And one of the one of the values, in fact, we've got at High Alpha Innovation is this idea that we we create opportunity. Uh, we're trying to create as much opportunity for as many people as we can. I find that incredibly fulfilling uh, and a source of joy, which I, I think is a, a good definition for success. A lot of people attribute, you know, success to uh, to monetary uh, measures. I, I do not. It's um, for me. It's uh, it's finding a sense of fulfillment and joy. Well, and we'll tie all that together again. I started with this Indiana Vision 2025, which is a project the Chambers worked on for eight plus years, and obviously we got five more to go. And again, that statement: Indiana, a global leader in innovation and economic opportunity. We just uh, tied, a, tied many of the things we just talked about together in that statement. I love it. Let's, let's do it. We're, uh, we're working hard to make that, uh, make that a reality. Well, Elliot, I know uh, so, so many uh, of the work that, that High Alpha has already done has been so beneficial for the state. Obviously, very excited about High Alpha innovation and some of the things that it will help create uh, within, within the great large-scale enterprises. Thanks so much for joining us today and, and for all the work that you and your team are doing. We really appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks to, thanks to you for all the work that, uh, that you're doing to, uh, to help companies grow and Indiana be a good place for innovation. All right. We will keep it up and do everything we can. Uh, I, I've mentioned a couple of times the Indiana, Indiana Vision 2025, the chamber released uh, just last month, the 2020 snapshot takes a look at Indiana compared to its Midwest neighbors. As, long, as well as some competitor states around the country. You can find all that information at indianachamber.com. We, we touched on best places to work. Uh, again, some of those high alpha companies are, are on the list this year. We'll be doing a virtual celebration on August 24th, uh, recognizing 125 companies for their outstanding workplace cultures. As always, we thank you for listening to the In Chamber. We'll be back with our next conversation in two weeks.